Welcome to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast, hosted by the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association. We provide you with up-to-date information on health topics geared towards the Orthodox Jewish community. This podcast content is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as medical advice or as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician. Welcome to the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association, or JOMA, podcast. I'm your host, Elisa Minkin. I am a general pediatrician and proud JOMA member. And today, I'm really honored and really excited to be speaking with Dr. Howard Foreman. Before I introduce him, please, if there's a topic you want to hear, if you want to be interviewed, you know someone you want to be interviewed, or you have a comment on any of the podcast episodes I've done already, please reach out to us at health, H-E-A-L-T-H, at joma.org. We want to hear from you. Howard Foreman, MD, is Director of Addiction Consultation Services at Montefiore and Assistant Professor at our Albert Einstein College of Medicine. His clinical interests focus on the intersection of addiction, mental health, and physical illness. He is also a leading forensic expert who has been retained by state prosecutors, federal prosecutors, leading law firms across the country. He earned his Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry and Environmental Science at Columbia University in 2001, followed by his Doctor of Medicine at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in 2008. After interning in psychiatry at the Beth Israel Medical Center from 2008 to 2009, he returned to Albert Einstein College of Medicine, completing a residency in psychiatry in 2012 and a fellowship in forensic psychiatry in 2013. In addition to his areas of clinical focus, he is a nationally sought-after lecturer, and his research has been published in peer-reviewed journals and abstracts. He is also co-author of Prescription Drug Abuse, a book exploring the risks and controversies surrounding the issue of prescription drug abuse and misuse. He is the book review editor for the Psychiatric Times, and his opinions have been featured in outlets as varied as the Rolling Stone magazine and the New York Times. For several years, he was a columnist for U.S. News and World Report. Dr. Foreman has been honored by the Albert Einstein College of Medicine with the Samuel Rosen Award for Excellence in Clinical Teaching and is a member of the Leo Davidoff Society for Excellence in Medical Student Education. He has served as a co-chair for the American Medical Association Action Team on Alcohol and Health and as president of the Bronx District Branch of the American Psychiatric Association. He is board certified in psychiatry, forensic psychiatry, and addiction medicine. He is a member of the American Psychiatric Association and serves on their Council for Medical Education and Lifelong Learning. Welcome, Dr. Foreman. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's a real, real uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, the pleasure and the honor is mine. I'm really excited about this because marijuana is a super, super important topic. And for some reason, I've been doing this for over three years and I haven't tackled it. It's really important. And so I want to talk about it with you. It is, you know, become controversial. We are going intentionally to avoid all talk about anything other than medical. We are not going to talk politics. We're not going to discuss legalization, et cetera, at all. Okay. Um, but I want you to start with, with terms, please, because there's so much confusion just over what are we talking about? So I guess that when, when I talk about marijuana, what I am talking about are uh, products that include uh, THC, right? Which is the uh, psycho hallucinogenic active ingredient uh, in marijuana, right? So what I'm not talking about is CBD oil, uh, which has been around for a couple of years uh, and you know has been marketed and you know unregulated. Uh, people uh, will state that it has all types of health benefits, uh, and uh, many products will claim that real elixir types of things, good for everything. Uh, We saw it with CBD. uh, Now we're seeing with THC. Uh, I I just have to say that it would be very hard not to mix politics in for me because- uh, (laughs) No, no, I'm just giving a warning. I'm giving a warning to your listeners because, you know, this is my- Disclaimer, it's a disclaimer. I see so many people suffering, right? right? Because people don't come to me when things are going great, right? right? People don't come to me because they use marijuana, you know, once a month with friends and have a great experience. Those people aren't coming to to see me. So uh, I will try and avoid politics, but uh, I think my politics will come through in my 
answers to medical questions. Yeah, just one point that there is a um, regulated form of the CBD Epidiolex is the brand name for um, certain types of intractable seizures. You know, um, obviously I'll know I've made it in life if uh, Dr. Stoll, one of the uh, JOMA uh, leaders shares this and uh, I presented on a panel with her and certainly, uh, I think that I don't know if I've met anyone who knows more about um, about medical uses of marijuana, really good uses of marijuana in, under the supervision of a doctor. Uh, so uh, anything on that, I would definitely defer to her. Right. And when you say medical marijuana, you mean with the THC? Well, when I discuss medical marijuana, what I'm talking about is marijuana that is prescribed by a health professional and obtained through regulated means. Right, but with the active ingredient, I'm just trying to make yes, a distinction between yes, the one with the CBD that has no psychoactive properties and marijuana with THC, which does, but does have medical uses, but we're not going to go into the weeds on that, not to, well, make it Yes, yeah, I'm just saying that's not my area of expertise. Yeah, that's fair. Uses, but, but I want to make very clear that, yes, medical marijuana is marijuana, uh, but medical, when I use the term medical marijuana, what I mean is prescribed by a physician mm -hmm. being used as prescribed and being obtained by means that one knows what they are getting. Right. And that's really important. Okay. So that's good about the terms. I loved, you gave me a list of questions and my favorite questions were, how do you approach this for different audiences? And, you know, you mentioned community leaders. Um, we talked about friends, neighbors, parents, patients. I'm guessing you have different approaches and I would love to hear kind of a synopsis of them. So I talked to, you know, when I address community leaders, I, I really do try and address the importance of that we really should be trying to lead people towards healthier, more meaningfully lived lives. And that we are always going to be sort of thought of as out of touch, right? I mean, you know, how many of us turn off our cell phones? Uh, how many of us have the privilege of turning off our cell phone, right? On right. You know, Friday night right? Uh, through Saturday, you know, we uh, observe dietary customs, many of us that are, you know, about 2000 years old or older, right? So uh, 3000 years. So, you know, we're going to be out of touch, right? We're not going to always be with the times, uh, but we can be right. And, uh, and we should be right. That's you know, I was also interested in, in, in when you said, you know, there are ways to do this that are actually counterproductive, you know, ways of addressing this issue. And I really want you to expand on that, please. So, so, and, and I want to speak specifically, um, there was a yeshiva in the town that I live in, and uh, I'm not a, I don't go to, my kids don't go to this yeshiva, but they had a night to train parents how to search their children's room mm. for marijuana, right? And all of the different places, and they actually set up a mock bedroom. Uh, and there was marijuana and parents could come and learn how to search their uh, children's rooms. Uh, so that, that was sponsored within the Jewish community, right? That's absolutely the wrong road to go down, right? Because um, it's like technology. If you, uh -huh. think you are, if you think you are going to be able to put on a filter that your kids <sighs> cannot solve, I mean, you might sleep better at night because you're fooling yourself, but don't sleep better at night because you think you've done something effectively, right? Our children are going to be exposed to all types of negative influences in their lives. We cannot control the exposure. We can, we can try, but we'll fail. What we can do though, is have conversations with our children that are based in reality. Right. That are based in reality. And so where do parents get it wrong? Where do community leaders get it wrong? Right. So uh, for those of us who are who are old enough, uh, if you recognize this commercial, you should plan a colonoscopy. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I know where you're going. <laughs> if you remember the the um, commercial, this is your brain. 
this is your brain on drugs, right? And it shows a crack <laughs> and frying and sizzling. Great filmmaking, powerful. We're talking about it today. Right. Terrible in terms of dis discouraging drug use. Why? Because here's the thing. If you see someone smoke marijuana, their brain is not fried, right? In fact, they may actually describe it as an enjoyable experience, as a relaxing experience. In fact, if you are an anxious person, and I am an anxious person, and you see someone in talk to him, you might be like, wow, that person is as cool as a cucumber. I want to be like that, right? So now you set up this paradox, right? Where there's this message that I've heard from everyone. If I use drugs, my head is going to explode. That's what you've heard. And then you see with your own eyes, someone not having necessarily a negative effect from it. So now one has to question what is the truth, right? And what I try and advise individuals when I'm speaking in a community forum rather than a uh, clinical forum, but is that we want to be honest with people. And so here's what it comes down to. So when I speak to my, you know, my 12 year old about drugs, right? And just in case uh, we want an idea, someone might say, okay, is 12 too young, is 12 too old? So the average age of the first alcoholic drink that people will have in the United States, unbeknownst to their parents, is 11, right? And, uh, and alcohol is obviously the first drug that most people will experiment with because it's widely available. But returning, what I say to my son is, I said, listen, here's the problem with marijuana. Here's the real problem. If you don't like it, well, why did you take the risk if for something that's not that you don't like, right? Why, why, why take any risk? I mean, the health risk of the inhaled smoke, the at sometimes legal risk, right? The judgment risk, right? People can do really uh, dumb, unintelligent, dangerous things when they are high. The risk of impaired, um, impaired, uh, you know. Uh, impaired ability to operate your body, uh, you know, ataxia, right? Why risk all that for something that you don't like? That's not enjoyable. And then on the other hand, if you really like it, why would you ever want to stop, right? If you, if you have marijuana and you enjoy it and you say, this is wonderful, what's going to prevent you the next day from using it and the day after, right? And then that's when you're going to run into the chronic effects that marijuana can have. And, you know, what are those most dangerous chronic effects? Well, the most dangerous chronic effects, right, uh, as a clinician are clearly, number one, psychosis, schizophrenia, right? Recent study that it's possible that 20 to 30% of the burden of schizophrenia uh, in males can be tied to uh, heavy marijuana use uh, during uh, the 20s to 30s, right? So that's, I, just have, I just have one question. I'm sorry. Is that, do we know that's causal or is it correlated? Well, as you, uh, as you can, uh, you know, as, as I'm sure many of your listeners know, right? Cause we can't do that study. We can't double blind people to, uh, to, uh, we can't double blind people to, uh, to, you know, smoke marijuana versus not right, smoke right. marijuana. So I would say, it's causal in the same sense that that nick that cigarette smoking is causal to lung cancer, right? So even though we can't do the double blind controlled studies where we, you know, say, okay, you guys are gonna smoke Marlboros, you know, one pack a day for 20 years, you guys are only gonna do it for five years and you guys aren't gonna smoke. But I don't think you or I or any of your listeners would doubt the the causative, right? Mm -hmm. So again. By a strictly scientific standpoint, it is only a correlation. Correlation does not imply causation, but uh, I would ask that you know people consider that they use the same standards that they would right. for evaluating that data, that we do all types of other things that we tell patients they should and shouldn't do. Right. Right. No, it's an important thing to know. So, um, and then so psychosis, 
schizophrenia, right? That bucket, that's a very terrible, dangerous bucket. But then also probably what I see most commonly is marijuana-related avolitionality, right? Mm -hmm. That people just lose their motivation to do anything. If they wake up and all they do before they go back to sleep is take a shower, then that might be fine. If all they do for months at a time is play on the Xbox, that might be fine. No drive for um, things that are productive for them personally or productive for the community at large or helpful to their families. And, you know, I'll have spouses reach out to me and, you know, describe to me what their typically a husband is uh, is going through and, you know, I have to very sadly oftentimes tell them that, you know, let's try and engage your husband in care. Let's try and get him into care. Let's try and stop the cannabis use. But I cannot promise that even if the cannabis use has ceased, that he will regain his motivation to be a parent or to go to work. And uh, very sad cases in, in mm. my community. Right. And we have to underscore that this is in all communities at this point. I mean, it, it's obvious to me and you, but nobody should fool themselves that there's some place that escapes this. Yeah, I, I think that that is absolutely true. And I also want to state, because although certainly this is a problem in, in my community, it's a problem, and I describe myself as, you know, modern Orthodox, mm -hmm. you know, um, but uh, but throughout the uh, you know Jewish communities, regardless where they are, this is a problem. And but I think that we sometimes don't give ourselves credit enough as a as a community of recognizing that although it's a problem and absolutely we should address it and we want to protect every member of our community from every harm to the best that we can. That I do think that maybe we struggle with this less. Mm -hmm. than than other communities. And, and I only point that out because I don't want us to labor under the belief that the strong communities that we have, the yeshivas, right. the, the shuls, the fact that we go to each other's houses, you know, and see each other and celebrate with each other and also comfort each other. I don't want us to lose sight that that is protective. It's right. not absolutely protective, but it is protective. To some extent. And I think that right. we should be, you know, we should be proud of our communities. And I think that we should move towards strengthening our communities. You know, drug use flourishes in solitude. Drug use flourishes when people are lonely. And combating loneliness, combating isolation can be one of the most important tools that we have in combating drug misuse and abuse. I'm so glad you said that. But I'm thinking about members of our community or just in general who are more vulnerable. And I know that you specialize, right, in the intersection of, of mental health and substance use. So I'd really like you to go there now, please. Well, so I, I think that many people may become involved in drugs because they are trying to treat something underlying, something that is bothering them that they are seeking relief from. And so in terms of people who are vulnerable, yes, people with mental illness, and we're not talking about severe mental illness, I'm talking about all mental illnesses are more at risk of developing a problem with marijuana, with drugs. And so that's the case, that's the presentation of what the, the vulnerable population is and what can we do. So what we can do, right, is not be afraid to reach out for help. Um, there are so many organizations that specialize in our community and communities, uh, places that might have a waiting room, right? Where each individual is in their own waiting room. I've actually seen this up in Muncie. Uh, each community member is in their own waiting room so wow. that they don't see another community member as they're seeking treatment for their drug or mental health problems, right? How wonderful is that, right? So that's someone who's saying, you know, of course we want to destigmatize mental illness, but we, but until we can conquer that, until we can destigmatize it, we want to give people the opportunity to get treatment in the most private way 
possible. So if you know someone who is struggling with mental illness, particularly a young person, right? Know that there are resources, reach out to community leaders. Uh, you know, if you don't go on the internet, which I respect, although I guess if you don't go on the internet, you're probably not listening to this, but well, that's not true because we put these up on a hotline as well. That for Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. So whatever, there are resources out there, seek them out and they are done in a way that is very sensitive to different parts of our community. Uh, and try and treat that mental illness so that the so that the dis the the discomfort that's caused by the mental illness does not, God forbid, lead to an addiction. Right? We want to avoid that. Right. And I really want you to explain: Is marijuana addictive or not? So marijuana is addictive. Marijuana is addictive, right? And I'm just going to define addiction mm -hmm. very, very broadly. Uh, addiction is continued use of something despite its known harms to you, right? So meaning that, and, and I like that definition because that can be internet, that can be gambling, that can be marijuana, which we're discussing today, that can be opiates, right? These, it's known use despite known harms. So- the addicted individual understands very frequently, this is not good for me, but I can't stop. And that's when someone has moved from, let's say, an impulsive pattern of use, right? Impulsive, meaning, oh, there it is, I'm going to use it to, I can't go through my day without knowing how I'm going to use it. Right. And you know, when, when you think of opiate addiction, you know, they have a withdrawal phenomenon and they're often using just to prevent withdrawal. You don't see that from marijuana, do you? I, I would I would argue that you do. I would argue that in in chronic users of marijuana, you definitely see an incredible level of anxiety when people are are um, are cutting use or coming off use and the way to stave off that anxiety is to continue using. Because you know what I see when I have patients who who really are heavy users is that they say, you know, this is just something I do and I don't need to, but I just like to. Well, so why don't you stop, right? Because there's, right, if, if, if it's that simple, if it's just something that you like to do, there are many things that we like to do. I enjoy sleeping in but I can't. And so I don't. Right. So if someone just enjoys marijuana, then, you know, ask them to challenge themselves. Okay. Can you go a week without it? Can you go? But, a week say, but I don't want to. Well, I mean, <laughs> um, the, right. Motivation is, mm -hmm. uh, is a real problem. What I would say is as a physician is that if we're having this conversation you're probably seeing some negative effect, right? If you're having the conversation, probably the parent maybe has said something to you or you've observed something or the person, you know, smells of marijuana, right? When they walk into the room and, you know, you realize, oh, if this person tried to get a job, right? If this person applied for a job, right? And they sit down to the interview, this person is going to smell the marijuana and say, oh, this may be someone that I want to bring on board in my company, right? So you probably are observing some negative, right? And I would, I would sort of counter that I don't want to with, you know, listen, I'm your doctor. You're coming here voluntarily and you're coming here because you want help from me. And part of the help that I'm giving you is suggesting that you cut down on, on your use of marijuana and that you don't want to I'm telling you that I think there would be benefits to it. Now, you can choose not to, right? I'm not, you know, I'm not following you home. What you do in your own home, right, is, is largely up to you. But this is my guidance. And that guidance is being given by someone who you have entrusted with your health, right? And so I think that when you point out to people that they've already trusted you, they've already made the step of, you know, I don't, I don't do this. But um, most of the people who are listening to this probably ask their patients to disrobe before they do the appointment, right? They put them in some, you know, 
humiliating gown. <laughs> Paper gown. Right? <laughs> the opening. You know, some humiliating that, that doesn't cover <laughs> anything, right? But right, most doctors do that. And I think that to point out to the patient, look at the trust you showed me. How many right. people do you get naked for? How many people can I do you, you know, would you go into a room and say, get naked and I'm going to come in and see you? So you've already entrusted me greatly. And I'm asking you to trust me one more step. So I think that deepening that relationship, showing how much they've put into you, how much trust can be a very, very positive step towards aligning what you wish for the patient and helping the patient wish it for themselves. Right. But I do see patients who come in for well visits and they are not coming to me because they feel like in any way, shape or form, they have problematic use. What about those? Well, I mean, again, the fact that you are seeing it right now, granted, if they're just sharing it with you. Yeah, that's what I'm talking right? about. If they're just sharing it, then I would maybe take the next step of asking, okay, is it interfering with this, that, or the other, right? And if the person says no, 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 at least you've planted in their mind that right. you as a clinician are thinking these are the problems that you might see. So, you know, it's not that, it's not that everyone who has a problem, unfortunately, not everyone who has a problem is going to recover. And unfortunately, not everyone who has a problem is going to recover the moment that they have a problem. Oh, it's Monday. I have a problem. Tuesday, I'm entering treatment. Wednesday, I'm better. And I'm going on and living, uh, of a life that's unaffected by drugs, right? Unaffected by cannabis. But, you know, you plant the seeds, you let people know, you know, I, I often tell patients that aren't ready for, mm. for treatment, I'll say, you know, you're a young person, oftentimes it's a young person, you know, early adulthood. And I said, I understand that you have dreams to go out and chase, that you have dreams that you want to run after. And that you you feel that you must right now. And I want to let you know that when you're done running, I'll still be here. Right. When you are done running, I will still be here ready to help. And so never feel that you can't come back. If it's five years later, if it's six years later, if it's you know in a month, I will be here. And the team of people who want to help you will be here. So um we can't ignore the tremendous cultural messages that people have that cannabis is very cool, right. that cannabis is going to help them achieve what they want to do. We can't ignore the messages that cannabis is going to make them more creative. Um, I, although we can find, I, I could bring up evidence to, to, to show that that's not in fact the case, um, but those messages are powerful. And so, you know, if you can't, you know, sometimes you can't fight that message. Uh, so it's better just to let someone play it out. Uh, hopefully not come to any real harm and then come back. Right. I mean, it's everywhere. I take my grandkids to the playground in the city and you're going through waves of marijuana smoke. <laughs> it's just right out there. It's, you know, it's incredible. I mean, yeah. the, the amount of places that you smell marijuana now is right. just it, it's just it's it's very sad for me it's sad because uh we know that the more marijuana available the more people will run into problems with it that is simply math that is just math right, right? And, and and back to parents you know because i'm thinking about the parents listening to this you know, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to say? I mean, you mentioned before that, you know, trying to stay on top and control your kids is, is a plan for failure, yeah. plus to ruin your relationship with them, which is your well, only I hope. Think, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, it's about educating. It, it's about letting kids know the risks, but not overstating the risks unnecessarily mm -hmm. so that they develop that paradox when they see a friend using. Um, it's about I think letting your kids talk to you about what their friends are doing and it not being a situation of, oh, if that's what goes on at his house, you can't be there, right? Because keep in mind, our children are, um, you know, their social circle is in many ways their lives, right? right? Because whereas you and I, hopefully, 
hopefully are at the point where we get to decide who we speak with, right? Oh, I want to speak with this person. I give them a call. I want to see this person. I go there for a Shabbos meal. Our children are trapped all day with anywhere from, mm. let's say, 10 to 30 other students, right, in a classroom. And they are trapped with them. They don't have any choice over who's in that room or not. That's a tremendous limitation of their social sphere. Right. And so, you know, once you start sort of putting up a, you can't go there, you can't be here, this person you can't talk to, this house you can't go to, right? Now you're setting up a situation where that child has to choose oftentimes between respecting your need, respecting your governance over them and also their social life and also, you know, whether to be truthful or not, meaning that, you know, you don't want necessarily your kids saying they're one place when they're somewhere else, right? right? It would be a much better situation for them to, let's say that you know where they are and you know the risks that are involved and that you've trained them to say, listen, if other kids are doing this, that doesn't mean you must do this. You're allergic. You have a health condition. You know, you can even go through things that people can say, you know, that, right. that could accept them from the pressure that would be put upon them to, to use. Right. And I'm going to quote Rabbi Tzvi Gluck and also Dr. Ken Ginsburg who says he got it from his mama, uh, the line that you tell your kid, wherever you are, whatever's happened, call me, you can have a code word, I'll pick you up, I won't yell, I won't ask questions. So like what you're saying is I'm going to stand by you, no matter what. And, and that, and that, there's nothing that we can't talk about, that there's nothing right. that we can't talk about, there's nothing that we shouldn't right. talk about. Right. What age do you think these conversations should start at? Oh, I was hoping you wouldn't ask that. I, I'm I sorry. Heard that, I heard that question <laughs> like as I was. I I think that it really has to be very child specific. Mm. I think that it has to be, you know. I think that what's a really good idea is to, you know, to get a sense from the child um, exactly what they have heard, what they've seen, you know, because children, if children have a good strong relationship with their parents they may want to tip off to you that they've seen something or they know something right so for example uh i was walking uh with my son in in new york city and he's like oh you can really smell the marijuana here right and he's like and so now okay so he he can identify oh there right. is marijuana there are people using it, right? Uh, so that's a tip, that's an entryway to that conversation, right? right? But I think that maybe, you know, I, I think that, you know, some conversations, which I would say that are, that are even harder than this are really conversations about intimacy. And and certainly if you do a podcast or if you have done a podcast- You've done it. You've done it. All right. Well, please send me the link after because I it, it's a struggle and I, yeah. I uh, you know, would benefit from it because that's a really I think that's a harder conversation. This conversation. It's true. It's true. Although, you know, different things could be harder for different people. Right. So yeah. Yeah. this is your area of expertise. Other so parents will be like, I can't do this either. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go back because we were talking about, say, a patient of mine, not a specific one, but generic patient of mine who comes in for a well visit and they're using marijuana heavily and they're telling me everything's fine, right? I've had situations where the patient has um, hyperemesis syndrome, which you can explain, and they still don't perceive it as a problem. And I want you to go into why that would be. <laughs> Two things to talk about, hyperemesis and this like disconnect. Yeah. So cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, I'll just explain that. So this is after heavy, consistent use that people have really intractable uh, vomiting. And what's interesting is that for reasons that are not completely clear, the only thing that seems to relieve it is actually very hot showers. And these people can spend, you know, when you get them in the hospital, um, you know, if it's a hospital where there's a shared bathroom or a shared shower, other patients are so angry because this person will be in the shower, you know, 18 hours a day, right? And so these patients, it's very interesting, right? Because we asked, is cannabis addictive? 
right? So the person has just been admitted to the hospital for a can cannabis related syndrome that is very uncomfortable. They are throwing up constantly to the shower, to the toilet, to throw up to the shower, right? And then they eventually stop, right? And what do we tell them? We tell them, if you continue smoking, this will happen again. And who do I see a week later? The same one. The same person, right? Right. And so clearly this actually shows the addictive nature, right? Because the person has just been admitted to the hospital. And it's not like a hospital, like where they just went in for something simple and comfortable. This is very uncomfortable. Uh, they can get tremendously dehydrated, require IV fluids, right? They are sick. Tear their esophagus. I've seen that. Oh, I've never, I've never seen that. Mm -hmm. you know, and go back and so do it again. That used to just be taught uh, in, uh, in surgery, right. As a, as an alcohol related, like, uh, you know, a Mallory Weiss or a mm -hmm. Mojave's right. And mm -hmm. uh, seen it. so, so I, I haven't seen it with me, but, uh, but with that said, um, and then the person, why? Because after they stop vomiting, then they start to feel all the anxiety, right? All of the terrible feelings of stopping marijuana use. So yeah, cannabinoid uh, hyperemesis syndrome. It's like, if you've seen it once, you'll never forget it. Cause right, just... right, right. But back to that disconnect, you know, because we, we talked before that we were going to talk a little bit about this sort of, you know, anosognosia where you don't even see the problem. Yeah. I think you called I, it the brain being hijacked. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the brain, yes. I mean, the brain being hijacked, right? So it's it's the brain that is addicted is neurologically, neurochemically different than the brain that has not been affected uh, by drugs and not by, and affected by addiction and patterns of misuse and dependency. And so, um, so the anosognosia, the not recognizing that you have a problem is, is part of this, right? And maybe the not recognizing that you have a problem is maybe the most severe form of addiction because uh, I describe that addiction is, you know, continued use despite known harms, right? If you can get to the point where you are completely blind to all of the harms, that's almost like an end stage addiction, if you will, because right. the person usually when they're transitioning can start to say like, oh, I really, you know, oh, I've missed work. Oh, that's not good, right? And now a couple months later, they, they've they been fired from the work and they don't care. And they, they've got like mail piling up of all the like, you've been terminated, here's your COBRA benefits, you know, and all the that mail that they haven't opened up, right? And they no longer care. They've lost motivation. So, so in a sense that, you know, but but the brain being hijacked, that term extends, right, beyond just the anosognosia. It also extends to the fact that these are biological agents. They are biologically powerful agents, and they can hijack the reward system, right? So, you know, there's a certain amount of pleasure that different activities should bring you, right? So for me, what's one of the most enjoyable activities? Ice cream, right? Ice cream is endlessly enjoyable for me. But when someone hide, when someone's brain is hijacked by drugs, including cannabis, right? Suddenly those things that we would say are normally pleasurable, right? No longer do it for them, right? Because their brain now requires that much more powerful psychoactive substance to fire the pleasure center or, you know, uh, the nucleus accumbens, uh, mm -hmm. is, it's called uh, scientifically, but, you know, much more easier, you know, to get that dopamine firing in the pleasure center, you know, food is no longer going to do it. Being with friends is no longer going to do it, right? And so fortunately, fortunately, with abstinence, with prolonged abstinence, we can get brains to re-experience the pleasure from things which are not so harmful, um, like ice cream. Do you find that they need um, more intense um, potency of marijuana? Like with other drugs, you know, in order to get the same pleasure, you need higher and higher. And I'm going to add something before I forget, which is the gateway 
question. Yeah. So, so to other me, substances. Sure. So let me let me uh, let me just try to other answer them in order. Um, in terms of needing higher potency, so not so they need more THC, right? Whether they're going to achieve that through smoking a certain potency more often, mm -hmm. or smoking a certain potency but inhaling more deeply, mm -hmm. right? Or if they're going to adjust the amount of THC in the cannabis that they're consuming, right? Those are all sort of different means, but so they're not necessarily going to move to a higher potency, but they may use more or use lower potency more efficiently, but what they will need is more and more THC. To the answer is yes. Right. The bottom line is the answer is the bottom yes. Is yes. Yes. You need more. Mm -hmm. And there's many ways to achieve getting more, right? Edibles, for example, edibles can deliver tremendous amounts of uh, marijuana to people. And, you know, unfortunately, I mean, you, you will, you know, if you, if you speak to enough people who are addicted, you know, um, edibles will be a way that they're able to, you know, serve their addiction on days when smoking is prohibited. And that's yeah. a whole separate issue with kids getting into the edibles and the toxicity right. of that. Oh my God, it's a terrible thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so then you asked about the gateway, right? So why, why is, why do we see that in people who are users of of drugs that almost all of them have a history of marijuana use and why simultaneously is it not really is the gateway idea not uh not such a um so accepted by the you know the current thinking on addiction so the gateway is that using this substance leads to other substances mm -hmm. right but um of course, with the amount of marijuana that's out there, just like the amount of alcohol that's out there, right, that it's not a very good gateway because many, many people will not have, will not progress to using other drugs, right? Because there's so many who are using it. It would be sort of like saying, you know, um, is, uh, is brushing your teeth a gateway to, you know, cocaine use? Well, I would say that most people who eventually use cocaine, almost all of them brush their teeth or brush their teeth at some point, but it's still not a good gateway. It's just that something is so common. Right. That it, you know, so you see that history. But what I would what I would challenge people to think about is the idea that marijuana to be bad has to be a gateway to something else bad. What I would challenge people to think that marijuana in itself can be a very dangerous, desolate destination uh, for people. And people can run into terrible problems through marijuana alone. You don't need to travel from marijuana to get to an unsafe place. It can be and frequently is an unsafe place in and of itself. Right. That's a hard message to get across nowadays. Um. It is very hard to fight. Yeah. It is very hard to fight what is a message that is extremely well funded, a message that, you know, governments and municipalities are getting behind because of uh because of all of the tax money that right. we, so there's you know, there's a lot of things pushing against encouraging kids not to use marijuana. I right. I will admit that, and uh, and that's a societal problem. I, I don't right. know. The, I don't know this. I mean, I have some ideas, but I, I far be for me to tell you I know the solution. Right. Um, trying and to. I, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I wanted to talk about potency because I think that's another big issue that we need to address. Okay. And that the potency. Correct me if I'm wrong. It is quite variable now, and there is a lot of much more potent marijuana than there used to be. Which yeah, would make so, sense if you have more use, right? It would make sense. Yeah. So marijuana, right? Potency. When we talk about potency, we're really talking about the amount of THC, um, you know, per ounce, let's say. So it used to be that marijuana was harvested in Mexico. <clears throat> it was desiccated. So it was dried out. It was formed into bricks and it was brought across the border. That whole process of desiccating it crushing it, making it into bricks, bringing it across uh, the border, 
um, really would decrease the THC content, right? Now, the horticultural um, steps to produce marijuana have advanced greatly in terms of uh, enhancing the amount of THC that's in a plant. Uh, marijuana can oftentimes be priced or graded uh, according to how much THC there is, so that a higher THC would be a more expensive plant. So if you're a marijuana farmer, you have a financial incentive to harvest more potent crops. Today, a lot of marijuana is smoked what we would call fresh, right? Without that desiccation, mm. right? So not only do you have the horticultural advancements, the agricultural advancements that are increasing, increasing the potency, but you also have the fact that it's consumed in a state that is fresh, that didn't go through a drying out process, a long shipping process, um, where you were not smoking it, you know, months or years after it was harvested, right? All things that would lower the THC. So that combines to make a very different potency. So if you are a parent or a grandparent who says, oh, like, no, like I saw people, you know, smoke pot and it was fine. Um, that pot is not today's pot. And I will say that in probably one of the most stunning turnabouts, I think, in uh, world trade, international trade, is that the United States of America is now a net exporter of marijuana to Mexico. So oh meaning that God. Mexico, Mexico, people in Mexico who, who use marijuana have determined that their own product that they are able to produce simply does not meet the standards of today's users. So that is, uh, that's if you can take one fact away from today's podcast, well, I hope it's not that fact because hopefully we've shared some useful information, but at least that's when you can say you're a uh, Chavez table. Right. This is not your grandma's marijuana. Not your grandmother's marijuana. Not even your mom's marijuana. Right. Hi. Okay. I want to go back to mental health issues intersecting just for a little bit, and then we're going to finish up because I think it's important to end on that because in terms of prevention, um, one of the things I would say that's really important is to pick up and treat mental health disorders early. Yeah especially yeah, and, in this case, anxiety, because I really do think that a lot of kids are self-medicating anxiety, yeah. specifically social anxiety. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so let's talk about that, right? That's how, that's a, so let's talk about the most common mental illness when you put them in a big basket is anxiety and certainly anxiety and depression, right? So what, what can a PCP do, right? So if your answer is refer to a child psychiatrist? Yes, but when you refer to a child psychiatrist, know that the likelihood that that person will be seen quickly may not be so high. And, and certainly if you're treating with patients with tremendous resources that can afford private pay, it will be quicker. But we cannot produce child psychiatrists quickly enough. We cannot, you know, we cannot produce them quickly enough. So what can a PCP do? So many states, and I would encourage, you know, I'm sure there's a high listenership here uh, in uh, New York. Mm -hmm. Many states have set up the ability to call for mental health guidance. So a PCP can get mental health guidance from mm -hmm. an expert, right? And they will pay the expert to sort of do, you know, it's not a necessarily a direct consultation of, okay, mm -hmm. here's the patient and, you know, they, evaluate, but that you can ask questions and learn, right? Because unfortunately, many, many PCPs uh, particularly in young people, they see that warning uh, that's attached to the SSRIs of increased right. uh, onset su suicidal ideation in in children. And I can tell you that that warning has done more harm. Right. So many young people have died because of that warning. We should be uh, we should mourn that warning, right. but right. it creates so much fear, um, and I understand that fear. And I, as a clinician, whenever I am making the choice to 
uh, and I only treat adults, but whenever I'm making the decision to give an SSRI to an 18 or a 19 year old, I discuss the warning with them. I go into the details. Uh, I get their consent. But in the back of my mind, yes, there is this, you know, this idea that there's this warning. And then I see all the data about how SSRIs save lives in, in people who are depressed, young people. But, but yet, you know, you see that warning and it just, you know, it, it just, it stabs you. Right, right, so, and right, right. And for those PC, I mean, sorry, but for those PCPs, when you're talking about New York, it's Project Teach. You're talking about the regional psychiatry programs where you can access a psychiatrist at the same day yeah. and get some help with it. Um, that's really, really important. Um, yeah. But for 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 the parents to know that if you're seeing anxiety or any mental health issues in your child, please don't wait. Please don't wait, and also talk to the talk to the doctor, right? Because you know, as parents, right, if you ask a parent what is normal, right, if you ask me what's normal, well, I look at my son, I look at my daughter, I look at, is it is it what their friends are doing? Okay, if it's their friends, what they're doing, it's probably normal, right? And if it's not, right, but that's a very small N, right? But your doctor, you know, your pediatrician, I don't know how many patients does a pediatrician see a year, 2,000, 3,000, I actually have no idea, Um but it's a lot. And so try and I don't want to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but try and get a sense from them of what is what is normal and what is abnormal. And you know, if I if I might, um just like if you have many children, just like every, you know, the same yeshiva might be not right for all of your kids. And if you have options, you might have a child in this yeshiva and that yeshiva. Same with pediatricians, same with adolescent medicine doctors, right? So, you know, this, you know, find a physician that your children connect with so that that doctor's appointment, that they feel that when it comes up for that well person visit, that well child visit every year, that they are not going in fear, but they're going uh, with excitement, particularly once they get to the age that they no longer need shots. Uh, but that connection, that ability to have an adult that you can share things that you cannot share with your parents uh, can be so powerful, so healing. Um, you want to create that space. Uh, and uh, and we just, you know, just to say that we will not get to where we need to get on with mental health professionals alone. Unfortunately, this falls to the PCPs. I, I wish that it wasn't. I wish that I wish that we had a larger workforce. I wish that we had a workforce that was large enough to where people could go for a standard mental health screening, just like they do a well person visit, right? We do not have that workforce. Right. But I also want to make, make the point that it's not just about medication. A PCP cannot do therapy. And a therapy like CBT and kinds of therapy maybe end up being first line for these kids with anxiety. And there are a number of places, say in the New York um, area, I'm on Long Island, we have LAJ that has clinics that are attached to different zip codes and that's a very helpful. So I would definitely find out what's in your area to help you. If you can get a social worker in your practice to help you coordinate services, that's really important because it's not just, it's never just pills. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's you know, medication can be, and frequently is incredibly helpful in the treatment mm -hmm. of mental health. Um, and there are almost always options, right? There are always options. And, you know, what I tell people, because, you know, sometimes I'll get a referral and, you know, I'll say, you know, I'm Dr. Foreman and they'll say, uh, oh, you're a psychiatrist, right? And I'll be like, yes. And they go, oh, that means you're just going to prescribe me meds. And I say, you know, coming to see me is not an agreement to take medication. It's not even an agreement that medications are indicated. Uh, I think that if you come to see me, that we'll have a discussion and I'll be able to present the options uh, to you. And, uh, and, you know, I think that that's true for, you know, I, I just want to say before we end that, you know, I had the opportunity to practice alongside uh, many psychiatrists, both adult and children, child psychiatrists who are leaders at JOMA, leaders. 
and they practice psychiatry the right way. And so if, if you are listening to this podcast and you really uh, want high quality mental health care, I would really, really suggest that, you know, and I don't, I would really suggest look at the JOMA leadership, look at the psychiatrists who are in leadership positions. And there is not one that I would not trust with my family. There's not one that I would not trust with my family. So, you know, it's hard to know quality, but that is quality. First of all, thank you so much. <laughs> Second of all, I've interviewed some of them. <laughs> so I interviewed Dr. Weinberger. I interviewed Dr. Becker recently on anxiety, and that overlaps to a certain degree with what you just said. So thank you for that plug yeah. well, I mean for it. our fantastic I mean psychiatrists. It. No, I know you do. I mean, it. they are, they are yeah. top notch and, you know, being on this podcast, you know, you said it's your honor. No, it, it's really my honor. And if, if, no together, we, if <laughs> together, if together we've helped uh, just a couple people, uh, I, I'm very proud of this hour. So thank you. I'm, I'm really, I'm really so honored. I just want to say one more thing. I just want to add one more thing before I forget, which is that we never mentioned ADHD. And one of the things that comes up with ADHD is I don't want my child to be medicated. I don't want them to be on drugs. And that still overlaps with what we said about anxiety, because I see the same thing with anxiety. I don't want my child to have drugs. And here we are talking about self-medicating for anxiety. There's also, I believe, an overlap with ADHD and any substance abuse, just yeah. even just due so, to so impulsivity. Me, I, I'm glad that you asked. Uh, let me just throw in that ADHD itself is a risk factor for drug abuse. Treating ADHD is not a risk factor for drug abuse, meaning that you have done nothing to increase your child's likelihood of abusing drugs by getting comprehensive treatment for ADHD. And again, um, I can't tell you how frequently the conversation is that people come to me as patients, but also just people in the community. Uh, you know, when you tell people you're a psychiatrist, they they immediately share with you things that are interesting. Uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, and, you know, one of the things is, you know, we fought medications for years. We fought it. We didn't do it. And then, you know, a couple days later, you know, our child is, uh, is, you know, coming home, you know, being able to complete their homework, right? And, and you see these like turnarounds and it's right. hard for me to believe actually that, you know, ADHD untreated can lead to lots of things that could lead to low self-esteem, right? poor school performance. Oh, you know, you forgot your baseball glove again, so you can't play in the game, right? All of these things that untreated ADHD can lead to. So it, it's hard for me to believe that if in, that not only does it not increase the likelihood of drug abuse, it doesn't, but also that you're going to maybe be able to have that child form into an adult who may be more resistant to, to overtures to use drugs. Right. No, for sure. It makes a lot of sense. You know, we could talk all day, but it's Arab Shabbos. <laughs> I'm going to have to end this, but I want to thank you so, so much for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. Real, real pleasure for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Shabbos. You too. Good Shabbos. Thanks for listening to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast. If you've enjoyed this, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share this with your friends. For more information, Check out our Instagram at joma underscore org. Check out our website, www.joma.org, that's J-O-W-M-A dot org, or email us at health at joma.org.